Standing by, the Terry and Ted podcast is sponsored by the UPS Store Canada. Oh, go. You mean go? Okay, go. Okay. We're going, Ted. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I am spent. Hi, I'm Terry DeMonte. That's Ted Bird. By the way, you can leave it. Leave all the nonsense in, eh, Matthew? Just open with, oh! <laughs> That's part of our charm, apparently. <laughs> yeah, <we're, laughs> Those guys are really bad. Yeah. It's part of their charm. <laughs> yeah, unrehearsed yeah. and no practice. <laughs> what? Are we on? <laughs> Terry DeMonte and Ted Bird, it's another edition of the Standing By podcast. On Election Day, we're recording this on Tuesday, November the 5th. You're listening to it Wednesday, I hope, Wednesday morning. A lot of people pick up the podcast and uh, you probably know what happened already. We do not. No. Record the day before. Uh, and Ted's a little spent because he's back in the radio game. I'm doing mornings this week at K103 in Ganawage, where I worked from 2010 to 2012. And uh, boy, am I having some fun over there, renewing old acquaintances. Nice. And uh, meeting some new folks. Terry was on the air with us this morning. We called him up. And uh, had him on, and uh, I wanted to give someone a shout out, and I've already forgotten who. Because, well, that's okay because you were up early uh, this yeah, morning. Uh, yeah, 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 there you go. Yeah. I, um, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, Leave that in too. Yeah, that's <laughs> really good. Yeah, <laughs> charmed. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody, um, I got a note from a listener who asked us why we didn't cut something out of the program. And uh, just so you know, um, we have a staff of none. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so yeah. we get some help from my lovely wife, Jessica. And of course, we have Matthew as our producer. But as far as a uh, production team, uh, that would be uh, me and Ted. So we don't have time yeah. to get the scissors out. Um, and also, um, I thought it was uh, kind of fun that you were back in the game. People think that you've gone back to K103 as a permanent host. You're no, filling in. No, I'm filling yeah. in this week for uh, Heo Kirby, yeah. or as I've called him like three times already, Kirby Heo. Okay. So I'm sure he's thrilled. <laughs> great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, Sorry, Heo. And you've got a great history in that community. You were welcomed with open arms and uh, have become uh, really respected over there. I got listener food the first day this week. Nice. Yeah. That's uh, jo lovely. Joanne Patton sent me in her pie. Isn't that nice? And, uh, I was offering it around the radio station and I said to, um, Jesse, who you were on the air with this morning, yeah. I said, uh, Hey Jesse, Joanne Patton sent me a uh, meat pie. And she looked at it and went, that's a thick one. Okay. <laughs> and I said, mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> hey, before we go any further, Please clarify the pizza burger that you posted on your social media. Everybody wanted to, I including know. me, wanted to know where you could get this thing. It was just a picture that was on a, a Facebook food group okay. page. And I don't even know what page. Yeah. I just went, wow, that looks good. I'm going sure to save that picture yeah. and, and post it. And I did alongside a picture of... Bacon potato soup, mm -hmm. which also looked awfully good. Must have been an American thing for sure, because guess, this yeah. was a, it looked like a giant hamburger inside a pizza. It, exactly, yeah. yeah. Well, that's looked, exactly what it was. Delicious. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I Absolutely wouldn't know whether delicious. to eat it with my hands yeah. or a knife and fork or what to do. I wonder if UPS could ship that. Probably. Like if we found the restaurant somewhere down in the States, I'll bet you UPS could help us. Yeah, it'd have to be same day or maybe frozen, and then you'd yeah. have to heat it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, our um, title sponsor is the UPS Store Canada, and uh, they have been with us for uh, a number of years now, and we're very excited that they continue to support the podcast, and we hope you'll support them when it comes time to ship something, to move something, or if you're starting up a business and you want to get shipping taken care of, or if you want to do other things, like you need a passport photo, you need a post office box. A lot of people have a successful home business and get tired of everything coming to the house. You can have a P.O. box opened at a UPS store near you, and they are everywhere. There's over 400 locations all around the country. And I know you've driven by one before for sure. You see the famous UPS store uh, logo, the famous UPS logo. And inside that store, you'll find an entrepreneur who is a local business owner, probably just like yourself, who runs that business with uh, service and um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They, they just... 
when you walk in the door, they want to know how they can help you. And it could be something as small as getting a roll of tape in a box, or it can be something as complicated as shipping to something to Vietnam. They can help you. It's a corporate brand with a small local business mentality. Yes. It's uh, the UPS store. And if you go online to the upsstore.ca, you'll find um, a great business blog that I read every week. It's got great ideas for small business owners in terms of things like, you know, shipping and decorating for the holidays and all of that. And with the holidays coming up, keep them in mind. If you've got stuff that needs to go across the country or for that matter, across the world, if you have like relatives in England and you've got to ship Christmas presents, they can help you with that too. The UPS store. .ca. Tell me about the boss. Ah, still, we're still buzzing about it. I've, I've seen Springsteen a couple of times. My wife, Jess, is such a massive, massive live music fan. We're going to England in uh, December, and the trip is built around Paul McCartney. So where Paul McCartney goes, we're I thought going. it was built around the uh, soccer game. Well, it also was built around Sorry, Manchester. Football. Yeah, Manchester United. <laughs> But uh, when um, we were living in BC, uh, Jess bought tickets for the Montreal show, and she said we're going to go to Montreal for the week, and we're going to, you know, we're going to visit, and uh, we're going to go see Springsteen. As it turned out, um, those tickets that she bought a year ago came in handy because we moved back to Quebec, and um, it was—I don't even know how to describe it. I, I described it on my Facebook page as, you know, this guy. This is the 75-year-old version of the boss. He, is he 75? He's 75. I thought he was 70. No, he's 75, Holy and smokes. it's the sharp-dressed man version yeah, of the boss. Yeah, he looks good. He looks oh, great. Oh, my God. And he comes out on stage with a shirt and a tie and a vest and, you know, a good old rock and roll pair of jeans. And uh, you get warned when you buy the tickets to see Springsteen uh, don't be late. There's no opening act, and uh, Bruce will be on uh, the stage at 7.30. And at 7.33, he hit the stage, and at 10.45, he said goodnight. And he barely came Jesus. up for air. I'm telling you, he barely even stops. Uh, it's just one song after another, and one song will end, and then he's counting the next song in. It really is incredible, and I was saying to Jess afterwards, and I put this on my Facebook post, we're kind of blessed. We're kind of privileged. This is a guy who has written songs that reflect the history of America over the last 50 years, and he's still performing at a high level. He's at the peak of his powers with a 17-piece band. There are 18 people on stage. Our old friend Randy Renault remarked that it reminded him of, you know, Joe Cocker in the 70s when Joe Cocker would tour with a big horn section and a bunch of musicians. And it just is so spectacular. It's awe-inspiring to watch. And a couple of times during the show, I thought, i got to sit down for a minute. (laughs) I thought to myself, no, get off your ass. Springsteen's yeah, 75. If, yeah, if 75-year-old Bruce can play yeah. still, you yeah. 66-year-old you can stand up and enjoy it. Yeah, it's it, it really was uh it was really, really special and spectacular. And I encourage you, if you get a chance to see him um on on this tour, don't pass it up. You won't be sorry. A lot of people are saying, eh, the tickets are so expensive. That's the way the of the world yeah. is, and I'm really and you get what you pay for. Yeah, and I'm I'm glad I'm lucky. You know, Jess and I are lucky. We can do it. We can afford it. And and she she picks the shows, and I follow right behind her. And am I ever glad that uh, that she said we're going to Springsteen because it was was unbelievable. There's there's still uh, we can save this for another episode. Concert etiquette is a little you know. Bruce was telling the story. He tells the story during the show of of losing an old friend of his. You know, and he's standing there with a guitar and he's talking about the song is called "Last Man Standing." There's three guys that, you know, when they were kids, they got together and formed a little bad and band, and one of them just has passed away. And he's trying to tell a story, and behind us, it's. <laughs> <laughs> well, among 20,000 yeah. people, there's going to be at least one of those. Yeah. Anyway, if you get a chance to see him, 
uh, go see him. It was uh, it was an amazing, amazing night. You got your poppy? Uh, it's in in the uh, control room. It's right. in we're in the control. We're room. We're in the control room. It's in the uh, it's in the outside green room studio part. We're going to bring a guest in yes. to talk about Remembrance Day, which is coming up this or next Monday, actually. As we record this, yeah. we keep forgetting. We're doing a podcast, so you may be listening to this in 2026. Yeah, we're recording so, it. <laughs> we're recording it uh, for November 5th, yeah, uh, 2024. Yes, and we've brought in uh, someone to talk to uh, about Remembrance Day, and maybe we'll use the uh, the pause while we usher our guest into the studio for you to get your poppy. I've got. I don't have a poppy per se, but this mm-hmm. is my. Uh, Op Husky uh, Canadian Military Commemoration T-shirt, and it has a poppy on it. Not so. not Husky the gas station. No, 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 no Husky no. the invasion yes. of Sicily. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just want to make that clear. All right. So we're going to take a, a quick break while we go outside and get our uh, guest. Uh, don't go away. You could even fast forward past this incredible music we're going to play for you. <laughs> We're back, and just before we get to our guest, we want to remind you, do not miss Sugar Sammy, comedian extraordinaire. Sammy's back in uh, France right now yeah. doing uh, Paris à beaucoup de talent, oui. you'll see. Yeah. Uh, and he's going to be touring across Canada over the winter, but more Montreal and Quebec area dates are in the works for 2025. Sammy sent us a note this week saying 26 new shows Added in 2025 in Montreal, Gatineau, Quebec City, and Moncton, which is a bilingual city where you're going to rear de would work just fine. Thank you very much. 2023 and 2024 were completely sold out. So don't dilly dally. Don't think about it. Go to sugarsammy.com now and get on the list to buy your tickets for 2025. And hey, just in time for Christmas. How about yes. that? Yeah, this would make a great Christmas gift, Buy actually. yourself some tickets yeah. and buy some tickets for somebody else for Christmas. And every time we talk about Sammy, we talk about his incredible crowd work. You can see what you're in for if you follow him on social media. Um, you can go to sugarsammy.com for tickets, um, but you can go to his Facebook page. You can follow him on Twitter. You can follow him on Instagram. And he always posts moments with the crowd, which are really incredible. It's a it's a demonstration of how quick he is on his feet, um, and always hilarious. It's a it's a little bit of a preview of of what you're going to see if you haven't seen him. That's a real craft too. Oh, I know, having dabbled in it and yeah. hosting comedy shows, crowd work like that is tough to yeah. be able to react and be funny yeah. to things that are happening in the moment. That's a real gift, and it's also something you have to work hard at, and yeah. he obviously does. Yeah, and he's fearless, and he's yeah. bold, Yeah, but he's not cruel. Does no. that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah. He's likable. Yeah, well, he's the he nicest man in the world. can't help but like Sammy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sugarsammy.com. Don't miss out, because people hesitate and wait, and they miss out on tickets. And again, as Ted points out, great idea for a Christmas gift. All right, we have a guest in the studio. Ted, I'll let you lead on this one. Colin Robinson is with us. Colin is a former commanding officer of the Royal Montreal Regiment and a former honorary lieutenant colonel as well. Have I got that right, Colin? Yeah, How am I doing and, so far? And honorary colonel as well. Honorary colonel? Yeah, I did both. Oh, you did, eh? Different What's the difference between colonel and lieutenant colonel? The double of pay. <laughs> <laughs> For Colin's for a, for, also very funny. That's for a important. volunteer position. Yeah. 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 I met Colin in Bosnia in 2001 when I got invited to go over on a media junket uh, at the tail end of uh, what was called S4, Stabilization Force, when NATO was putting the finishing touches on the peace treaty in Bosnia. And Colin uh, was at one of the Canadian bases there and was giving... Uh, uh, what were you giving? It was a, it was a, like a presentation. Just giving uh, a briefing on the a uh, briefing. political situation. That's it. Yeah, listen history. to me. Yeah. <laughs> briefing, they're called in the military. <laughs> more briefing, <laughs> more briefing. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I'll never forget that when it came, there was a picture of, of Tito, the former Yugoslavian dictator, and Colin said, "And this is me when I had hair." <laughs> 
Did you say that during the Governor General's briefing? I did. <laughs> and? It landed really well. She was awesome. That was Adrian Clarkson at the it time, was, was yeah, it? Right? Yeah. had less of a sense of humor, but she, she thought oh, it was Oh, really, great. eh? Oh, good. Well, as long as she laughed, then, uh, then uh, you're a winner in my books. Colin's here to talk about Remembrance Day and the Poppy Campaign. Tell us about your history with the Poppy Campaign. I got involved uh, when I released from the Armed Forces, <clears throat> excuse me, which would have been back in around 2009. I got roped in 2010, 10, 2011. Uh, and then I was uh, managing the Poppy campaign for our branch. And really, I think that was a big turning point, not because of my involvement. It was more because of the uh, Afghan war at the time and Canada's involvement. And uh, people, most Canadians, their appreciation for remembrance and for the poppy had been waning over the years. And if you go back through history, you'll see that it, it ebbs and flows uh, based on what's going on in the world. And we saw a huge resurgence. And whereas uh, a branch like ours, a typical little branch, we're in Westmount, we've got 100 odd members. And, um, you know, we're out doing a little volunteering and uh, at different kiosks in Westmount. And we would collect, you know, ten to $12,000 a year. Um, that jumped up to about sixty-five, seventy thousand dollars a year, and that's oh. pretty common right across the country. Um, in that, Canadians really start to recognize the sacrifice are being made, uh, not just by the servicemen, but also by the families uh, of the service uh, men and women. I'm pleasantly surprised to hear that because yes. I thought that it had waned, and I didn't realize that it it had that the awareness had had uh, had experienced a resurgence with Afghanistan because we're of the age. And you're not uh, as old as Terry and I, uh, but you also grew up in a time when there were a lot of World War II veterans still around. And we got Remembrance Day off at school. I specifically remember that when we were kids. And it wasn't, yay, we're getting a day off. We knew why we were getting that day off. And we knew how important it was and why it was that important. And I thought that that had faded and that uh, awareness was was a real challenge. So it's nice to hear that... You know, it's a shame that it took guys going to Afghanistan and sacrificing for the. Well, it's also part of the uh, the new Canadian um, package when you come over. It's part of like, and it's, you know, you, there's symbolism. If you check your twenty dollar bill, if you guys both want to give me a twenty, I can show you. Okay. Um, <laughs> but there's, uh, you know, Vimy memorials on there. There's poppies on there. Uh, it's it is woven into our culture. And one of the things I find most rewarding about volunteering on the poppy campaign every year is is uh, dealing with new Canadians. And you get someone who walks up and go, what's this? Uh, and so you get a chance to explain it to them. And you see them stand a little straighter. Mm-hmm. Um, they're proud to be now welcomed into a country that so many men and women had laid down their lives and sacrificed um, so that we could live in such a great country. In your time in the military, did you see diversity within the military? Was that a, a, a time when more and more new Canadians were coming in? Yeah, I mean, especially my regiment, the Royal Montreal Regiment. I mean, I joined in 89. I was one of the few white guys around. Uh, really, like, eh? Yeah, it's the United Nations. <laughs> You're like me on the 72 bus from Code for yeah. Two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the, uh, the city regiments, like the Black Watch and the Fusion Montreal and the uh, Regiment Maison of the Guards and ourselves. And same thing in, in the major urban centers. They've always been a reflection of the melting pot in Canada. Where you saw a difference was in the regular forces uh, oftentimes. Like when I first volunteered to go over with a, to Bosnia with the Van Dues, and uh, you realize, oh, it's a, it's a very white male uh, grouping at the time. Really? Eh? Mm. So the reserves are more diverse than the, the reserves in urban areas. Yes, okay, absolutely. Yeah. You and I were talking, Colin, just before you came into the studio about uh, what happens in Holland, um, and I was wondering, um, you know, in in Holland, you you don't go at, get out of school without learning about the Canadian sacrifice in World War II. Um, it's it's a must, and the remembrance, the level of respect and remembrance for what Canadians did in Holland is astonishing and makes me cry every year when I see it on YouTube. Um, Do you think that that should be part of the way we approach it here in this country? Uh, Yes and no. It already is. I mean, to that same extent, we weren't, let's, let's, let's be clear. We weren't occupied by the Nazis. Um, And uh, we didn't suffer the hunger winter. Uh, We didn't have any of those kind of atrocities that went through there. We didn't have people, part of the resistance who were sacrificing themselves and putting themselves and their families and their communities at tremendous risk. Um, that being said, uh, close to 10% of all Canadians uh, during World War II volunteered for overseas service. I mean, that's a huge, 
huge number. Um, I've, I helped start something called Je Me Souviens, which is a, it's a history educational program that teaches about military history and talks about Canada and Quebec's role uh, in World War I, World War, well, throughout the entire 20th century, and provides free teaching materials to, uh, to teachers to help get that across. Um, I'm going to ask you this question without diving into anything political, but it's a pet peeve of mine. What's your position on, oh, this is my version of the poppy? Uh, the Royal Canadian Legion is very clear that there's one version of the poppy, and that's the one that you're wearing yeah. on, on your chest right now. And people don't understand the people who want to um, appropriate the poppy for their own cause or... Well, the Legion won't let you. They'll take no. it to court, won't they? They will, yeah. It's, and, it's, the intellectual property is registered by the Royal Canadian Legion through an act of parliament uh, in the 1950s. Only the Legion is authorized to distribute poppies in exchange for for donations, uh, and the Legion is charged by Parliament to conduct remembrance throughout Canada. And people forget that when you buy a poppy, the money that you put in the box is going to all of the different causes that are supported by... Correct, yeah. yeah. Every donation you make in exchange for yeah. receiving a poppy, uh, there's very specific guidelines on what it's allowed to be used for. Yeah. And the poppy funds have to be used within the calendar year following the campaign. So that it doesn't just sit there in like a Scrooge McDuck uh, you know, swimming pool kind of thing. It, it has to be given on very specific causes related to veterans and their families. Right. So when you talked earlier about the increase that... So there was an increase in funds that suddenly began to come, come in... That, that makes a difference for you guys. Absolutely. Yeah. And it uh, helps us. Helps us uh, we, we, we're, our particular branch, I'm speaking for uh, Branch 14 in Westmount, uh, where we're very supportive in the community is there's Adaptive Sports Foundation, which is based, started off in the Eastern Townships. They help, uh, they help all sorts of people who have um, had a limb amputated, uh, how, to, how, to, uh, how to get back into sports. And they were very helpful uh, when we started seeing a, a, a large number of amputees coming back from Afghanistan. And so we started helping them with that kind of funding and also the Old Brewery Mission with their, right. their homeless veterans um, a program, program that they've been running. Yeah. Yeah. Colin, I brought something in that I wanted to share and I thought that uh, you would appreciate it and that would it would resonate with you as well as with Terry. When my grandmother died, my parents put together a scrapbook of, of some mementos uh, from her World War II experience, which was losing her brother, yeah. who was in the Carlton New York Regiment right, yeah. out of New Brunswick. And, and um, he died at 24 in Italy, New Year's Eve, 1943. And I'm named after him. So my parents uh, put together this scrapbook, and it's got pictures of him, and it's got uh, a couple of his medals and letters. And uh, Matthew, if I can get you to put up that first, uh, that first graphic... That's him on the left, Lance Corporal uh, Edward Harold Williston, known as Ted. And that's his gravestone on the right at the Morrow River been Cemetery to, in Italy, which I've been to, yeah. yeah. And uh, the telegram that my grandmother received, and I'll get you to put that up, Matthew, that second, the second graphic. If you're watching on YouTube, by the yeah, way, Yeah, if you'll you're see watching this. on yeah. YouTube, uh, it's, it's like it seems impersonal, it's from Canadian Pacific Telegraph's Worldwide Communications, my grandmother's name and address. Regret deeply, Lance Corporal Edward Harold Williston, officially reported killed in action 31st December 1943. Stop. Further information follows when received. Director of Records. So that's kind of like, you know, your brother died. We'll yeah. get back to you when we know more. more. Yeah. But. 40,000 Canadians, I think, died in World War II. Yeah. So those things were going out by the dozens, if not the hundreds, every day. But then a few weeks later, she received a letter from the regimental chaplain, chaplain uh, that was handwritten. And um, you can see that up on the, uh, on the screen now if you're, if you're watching on YouTube. And I, uh, did you get the, the note that I sent you on that, Terry? Uh, I did, yeah. I, I asked, sh should have brought this up yeah, a little bit earlier. I, I, I asked Terry, at the risk of being maudlin, but I don't think it's maudlin because it's history. It's, it's, it's a remarkable piece of history. It's a letter from a chaplain, a letter of condolence to someone who's, uh, who's next of kin uh, had, been, uh, had been killed in the war. And uh, it's really, really powerful. I mean, if you, you can see Colin on the screen there, how beautiful the handwriting is. How's that for a lost start? Yeah. And think that he's writing that in December in Italy in the mud and the shit on the battlefield and the blood. He's probably sitting in a tent and he's writing one after another of these. 
And, and it's not a form letter. Each letter describes the circumstances surrounding the death of, of, uh, of whichever soldier was killed and whoever, who's, whoever's relatives uh, he's writing to. I have it here, Tara, if you can. Yeah, can't. could you if please? You can't, are you going to be able to read the handwriting? I think I'm going to. Yeah. 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 I think, yeah, for sure I will be able to. Okay, right. flip, flip it over. I, don't, I wouldn't read the whole thing. Okay. Just the, just the last couple of par- paragraphs starting uh, with, it is sheer tragedy. It is sheer tragedy to be losing these lads. Canada needs them, and God knows we need our brothers ourselves. But how great is it that they are dying to preserve? May God have mercy on us if ever... If ever again, we Thank regard you. the sanctity... You remember this well, yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, if ever again we regard the sanctity and beauty of home or honor or liberty lightly to save these. You're going to have to read it. Ted, okay. I, I, I thought I could. To save these things, your brother and others are willingly placing their lives in the balance. That is a marvelous thing. What can I say to comfort you? Surely nothing better than this that has been tested and tried in the fire. God is merciful and strong to save to the uttermost if we but cling to him. So I say to you, cling to him with all your might, and he will give you strength and courage and peace that is altogether new to you. Do let him help carry your burden of grief. God bless you and yours. Most sincerely, E.W. McQuarrie, Regimental Chapman. You've read that. Chaplain. A, you've read that a number of times. Yeah, obviously, yeah. It's hard, it's hard, I, I asked you to because it's yeah. hard for me to read it. Yes, without getting emotional. Yeah, but you are. It's, it's so a, powerful. Yeah. And and it, what a piece of history that is. Yeah, well, that's that why you're I'm, holding the yes. original letter in your hand. And when I'm not here any longer, my instructions to my children are: yeah. you hang on to this yeah. and protect it, or maybe take it to a museum, maybe take it to the regimental museum, the Carlton and York's regimental museum. As you said, the chaplain wrote that in the in the you know yeah, under horrible conditions. Conditions, yeah, yeah. at the front, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's really something else, and yeah. that's that's one example of how many forty thousand Canadians in World War II, I think, and sixty, I believe, in World War One. Yeah, close to sixty six, I think, the final count. Yeah. Uh, the the I'll I'll give you some perspective on something that, as horrible as uh, what you just described is, potentially even worse, is when you think of that telegram, if it said missing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in World War One, in particular, the ground troops, the army, there were a lot of missing, like over half of the RMR, like every other infantry battalion, uh, half of the graves are unknown. We don't know where they're buried. And in World War Two, where the vast majority of the deaths uh, coming out of uh, the Canadian service uh, folks were from the Royal Canadian Air Force, those were bombers going down. Yeah. And so oftentimes it was missing they didn't have confirmation they didn't right. see and i th- the the reason i say it, it could be worse than uh the telegram uh, that your grandmother received is that when when do you when do you give up hope right so like the battle of leopold canal which our museum has an exhibition on right now uh at our armory on st Catherine street uh there's a there's a section on it that describes the life of prisoners of war so canadians uh, we had 13 i think it was rmrs who were taken prisoner at that battle and so by the time that you would have been taken prisoner, moved to the rear, processed, the Red Cross notified, all that, the, the families would have been notified that they were missing, presumed capture or missing, presumed dead. Uh, and how long would you sit on that? And How long would you sit on that hope that maybe he's unconscious, maybe he's got amnesia, maybe he's somewhere? Uh, I think that's, that's, that's yeah. a difficult Whereas one. Whereas my grandmother got... At least there was some immediate certainty. closure. Yeah. yeah, I remember I, my aunt telling the story of the day that that telegram came, and she said when the when the telegram guy came down the street on his bicycle, yeah, everyone yeah. stopped what they were doing and held their breath, yeah. hoping beyond hope yeah. that he was going to ride past their yeah. place. Because if he turned up your driveway, yeah, and he, when he did that day, my aunt says my grandmother went, "Oh no," yeah, and she knew. Yeah, I, I can't imagine living with that every day, wondering, you know, what your brother was going through on the other side of the world and and only imagining, only being able to imagine. And that that horror was, um, it's a, there were so many powerful moments in Saving Private Ryan, but when they, the, uh, 
the uh, the Jeep is coming up the long driveway on the farm. Yeah. And the mother is washing the dishes and she sees the Jeep coming and she knows right away. Yeah. It's a, I guess thousands and thousands of families had that experience. Your grandmother with the bike and other people with the knock on the door. It must have been horrible. Yeah, and and countrywide. And just I was thinking about that on the way here this morning. You know, Afghanistan was, the, the casualties were not nearly as great. And so it wasn't as, the war, the Afghan war was not as omnipresent as, uh, as a global war, which again uh, makes me uh, surprised and pleasantly so to know that it did uh, regenerate awareness for the poppy campaign. Yeah, you bring up a good point because in World War One, World War Two, like Canada was at war. In Afghanistan, it felt like the Canadian military was at war. It really wasn't affecting greater society. But Canada in World War Two, in one week in '43, uh, some of the stats that came out from this exhibition, like on the home front, we were producing eighty ships. Uh, sorry, six ships, eighty aircraft, something like four thousand vehicles, twenty-five million cartridges. Total a mobilization a week. Yeah, a week. A week. Um, um, just being cranked out. Yeah. Why do you think? You and I sort of touched on it, and I don't want to get into it, but when you look at what goes on today in the news on a daily basis, I watch the news and I think, why don't these people understand their history? Is it at the academ- academic academic level? Is it is it academia? Is it the families at home? Should people be telling their kids about the sacrifice? Like, you know, they're, they're, there's a whole generation of people who you could say, uh, what's the significance of June 6, 1944? And they, they wouldn't know. Uh, unfortunately, the vast majority probably wouldn't know. Yeah. Uh, even those who have successfully you know, graduated high school. And yeah. Right across Canada. Yeah, it's part of the it, curriculum and is covered. And it's just... Should that change, Colin? I guess you, you can't change it. Can't I was going to say, uh, it's hard... It, it exists. It's part of the curriculum. You yeah. should know. Yeah. Uh, these are part of it. And yeah. I guarantee you, if, you know, part of the citizenship exam, it, yeah. these kind of questions are there. Is it retained? Uh, is it reinforced? That's that's part of the job. Well, I think, you know, what helped us um, in terms of, of remembering and, and honoring that generation was we knew them. Yeah. yeah. I know guys who landed, well, or knew guys who landed on. When, uh, in, when we were in our 30s, you could buy a poppy from a guy who yeah. was at the, on the beach in Normandy. And shake his hand yeah, and, say, and say thank, thank you. you. And most yeah. of them were like embarrassed yes. Yes. that you would shake their yes. hand and say thank you. They were yeah. like, oh, I didn't really do anything. Yeah. Bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was in the third wave. It didn't count. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so humble, eh? Yeah, I used to deal yeah. with a gentleman. He was a president of our legion, uh, John McConaughey. He had been uh, a great guy. And uh, he's from Point St. Charles, been part of the regiment, uh, deployed in 39. Um, and they they did nothing until 44. Yeah. His only real action was at Leopold Canal. And he's in there for like half a day and got a uh, machine gun in the arm. And then he was evacuated out and wow. all that kind of stuff. And uh but he was the most humble, self-effacing. Oh, yeah, I didn't know. Yeah. I was just trying to. I was, I was just trying to go rescue someone, and I got shot. Oh, just that. Oh, you just got shot. It's. I think it's generational. My grandfather served, Bill Betchley, and uh, uh, Papa would not. He didn't want to talk about it. He would say, "Well, I peeled potatoes," and you know, like he. You just. You knew he just. He was not going to talk about it and let it go. And I wish. I wish. I wish I would have pushed him a little more. Yeah, it's uh, one of the reasons. It's, it's still the same today. Yeah. One of the challenges yeah. is people just don't really understand. They don't relate. No. And you start, you find yourself trying to provide more and more context and perspective, and people's eyes are glazing over. You're like, okay, forget it. Yeah, <laughs> I'll just go Call, talk to my buddies. Let me <laughs> ask you about the medals that are on your jacket. If you're, you're, if you've downloaded this podcast, you can't see it, but there are some medals on the jacket that Colin's wearing, and you see these often. And I'm always embarrassed to, you know, we bought a poppy the other day in St. Jerome from a. a vet who, you know, was probably in his seventies and he was festooned with medals and I wanted to ask him, but I, you could tell he didn't want to, you know, he would have been embarrassed had I asked him and I don't mean to embarrass you, but we see this all the time. And uh, what, what do they, what do they signify? Well, spoiler alert, nothing, nothing fancy on these ones. Okay. Uh, so the, <laughs> yeah. the red one is called the Canadian Force of Decoration. Yeah. And it just means you get the first red medal by itself. Uh, for 12 years of service, uh, we call it the 12 years of undetected crime. And then the, the, <laughs> bar, the bar, you get a bar for every 10 years of additional service. So that okay. signifies that I'd done at least 22 years of service. 
this one is the campaign medal for Bosnia when I was over in S4 where I was uh, yeah. trying out for Tito and uh, <laughs> Ted. And uh, this one, I get in trouble when I call it my two for one medal because uh, <laughs> it's, I got this medal because I got that medal. This is, okay. the, uh, <laughs> this is the Canadian Forces Peacekeeping Medal because Canada had been awarded the um, Nobel Prize for Peacekeeping and uh, all Canadians have served overseas uh, peacekeeping missions get that where will you be on remembrance day i will be uh downtown uh with branch 14 of the uh, royal montreal regiment association our legion and uh, i'll be there for the ceremony and then we will probably all repair offwards afterwards to a local institution to sample some fine beers Understood. <laughs> colin thank you yeah thanks for coming in and thank you for your service as they say yes my pleasure thanks yeah. for having me on thanks colin We'll be back in just a moment. That was uh, great having uh, Colin in, in time for Remembrance Day. Again, it depends on when you're listening to the podcast. We're recording this on Tuesday, November 5th, so Remembrance Day is on the way. And if you listen to Ted and I on the radio over the years, you know, we think it's very, very important still. And it's important even more so now that there's a lot of, oh, what's that for? Yeah. Um, we just, we like to uh, remind everybody about the service and the sacrifice. Yeah. And it's important on uh, other days as well. Yeah. Not just November 11th. Yeah. A couple of things. Um, uh, Peter Nixon on Instagram asked me to relay um, the story of the difference in concert crowds. Um, when we were talking about Springsteen, when we started the podcast this morning, I forgot to mention, Peter Nixon said to me, can you tell me the story about crowds in Seattle and Vancouver? They don't even come close to the kinds of crowds, uh, that go to the Bell Center. Um, as a matter of fact, at the end of the Springsteen show, we were looking up at the big screen and, uh, little Steven leaned into the boss and said, what a crowd. You could like, read his lips. You could read his lips. Yeah. They were really, really, really thrilled about it. And Jake Clemens on Instagram put a bilingual message. In, That's in, Springsteen's uh, yeah, saxophone player. Yeah, saxophone player who's the nephew of the big man, the original uh, saxophone player for Springsteen. And Peter was wondering if we noticed a difference when we were on the West Coast. And Peter, we did. People are much more restrained, um, not as enthusiastic. Don't get me wrong. People that go to a show in Seattle or Vancouver are excited to be at the show, but they don't wear their hearts on their sleeves like uh, Quebecers do. They're, they're a little bit more tied down, if you know what I mean. They, yeah. you know, they're excited and they're anxious. And in Vancouver, it depends on what show you go to. Um, you know, there's people barfing and falling down the stairs and <laughs> it's, it really, really My kind of crowd. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, we, we went to see a couple of uh, shows. Um, you know, Shania Twain was one and there was a couple of other ones where, you know, people were barfing and tripping ah. and getting up and down, you know, they, the, the the point of the night for them was to get as drunk as they possibly could, whereas we just like to go so see the So they could music. black out and yeah. forget the show. Yeah. Good thinking. Yeah. Anyway, uh, all of that to say, Peter, you are right. There is a difference between West Coast and East Coast, at least in this country. That has been our experience. I also want to say hi to Carol. This almost seemed set up. I was getting my winter tires put on at Merson. So I'm, I'm standing there and I'm talking to Celso and he's asking me questions because, you know, we just moved back. So I've got a different car and do I want to store my winter tires, blah, 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 it's summer tires, blah, blah, blah. And Carol comes up to me and she says, excuse me, I just want to tell you, Terry, how much I love the podcast. She said, we really, really are enjoying listening to you and Ted. It's great to have you back. We miss your kind of presentation on radio these days. It's lovely to meet you. And she gushed about the Standing By podcast. And when she left, I had to turn to Celso and say, I, I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't set that up. I, I swear to God, I didn't set that up. And um, I was in town last week for other things, and I was coming out of the Tim Hortons on Carey, and a guy was walking past me, and I wished I would have asked him his name. He, he just he pointed at me, and he said, 
I love the podcast. Keep it up, guys. Nice. And he was driving a truck for Allard A. Ricard, Allard and Ricard Plumbing. I wished I would have asked him his name, but he got in the truck. He obviously was on lunch at Tim Hortons. And uh, more, more people are approaching me and not talking to me about the old days. They're talking about the podcast, and, and I can't, I can't That's tell you nice to hear. how much I appreciate it. Here are some other new listeners slash viewers that we've recruited for the podcast through Merson. Remember I was telling you that Charlie at Merson told me if I wanted to get the starter fixed on my car, it yes. was not something that they could do. Yeah. You have to go to the dealer, he said, for yeah. that. So I went up to VW Sources, fearing the worst, thinking it's the dealer. Uh, they're going to take me for a ride. Hey, here he God. comes. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, Sebastien took great care of me. Uh, he was the uh, he was the service um, uh, the service representative. Uh, he sat next to Ward from the parts department, and when I went in, Ward went, "Hey, it's Ted Bird." <laughs> <laughs> That's and cool. I thought, okay, this that's, bodes well. Yeah, 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 that's fun. So Seb, who's younger, yeah. and Seb's colleague Mina were like, who's Ted Bird? Yeah. And so Ward said, oh, the radio, <laughs> the podcast. So now they're new fans. All well, right. I hope they're fans of yeah, the podcast. I hope so, too. I told them I'd give them a shout-out this week. So uh, Seb and Ward and, uh, and Mina, thank you so much. Uh, they treated me really well. Uh, it was not nearly as expensive as I thought it would be. I hope I don't get Seb in trouble when I say he didn't charge me for the diagnostic. Right. He just charged me for the parts and the labor. Yes. And it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. And Good God news. bless Charlie at Merson yes. for sending me, and this isn't the first time this has happened, at Merson. I've gone there before and had issues with my car, and Charlie will say straight out, that's not our area of expertise. You've got to take that to the dealer, or you've got to go see this guy, or you've got to go see that guy, because they know what they're doing with that particular problem on that particular model. Another one of the great things about Merson, they're not just going to take your car and go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah we yeah. can do that, and then do it wrong and yeah. give it back to you and charge you $2,000. It's not the way they operate. When I was sitting in the waiting room, um, I was I was kind of holding court because there was a couple of people who recognized me in the waiting room. And it was busy because it's this time of the year. Um, and uh, they people were asking me about the differences between BC and Quebec. And it dawned on me, it's one of the reasons I love being back is because those kinds of conversations with strangers in that comfortable waiting room at Merson's are the kind of thing that really happen in not too many places. Yeah. And I wished I would have got everybody's name, but I didn't. And um, I sat there and waited as the Mersons were very, very busy. And while I was there, there was a guy at the counter who had come into the store and wanted to know why they couldn't take him right away. Can't you just put my snow tires on now? And Celso had to, you know, politely explain that, they're kind of busy yeah. at this time of the year. <laughs> and uh, no, you know, you can leave your car and we'll get to it when we can get to it. But you really should make an appointment. Oh, yeah, 100%. And believe me, this is the place to get these kinds of things done. The Mersons are the best at it. If you listen to the podcast, you know that. They're right at the corner of St. Jacques and Cavendish. And how's this for service? The day before I went for my appointment... Valerie put a note together reminding everybody of the traffic nonsense that's going on at the corner of Sherbrooke and Cavendish. She said, I notice you have an appointment tomorrow. You may want to steer clear of that uh, corner and come in from another direction. How's that for service? Wow. Yeah. Way to that's bail out that commercial because me plugging VW sources was not the best Merson commercial that well, we've no, ever done. Well, no. You know what? I, I, think, I, think it's a, I, I actually think it's a great tenant of what Merson's does. It's, yeah. It's a, it's a story about how honest they well, are. Well, yeah, hundred percent. And that's how you ended up going there. That's how I ended up going there. Cause we don't know anything about cars and, and you know, we couldn't, I mean, when's the last time you changed the tire? Uh, I'm going to go with never. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what I mean. That's, that's who we are. So when Charlie or Celso or any of the guys comes out and says, you know, like when I when I went up and got my keys from Celso when my car was finished, he said, your oil's good, your brakes are good, um, your wipers are fine. It, like stuff that I didn't ask them to, to, yeah. to look at, they looked at because they often, this is the way they do business. They realize that your vehicle is carrying the most important things in your world, your family, your kids, you know, your relatives. 
Your you, boss. You know what else I don't know anything about? What? Electricity. <laughs> But there's someone I saw on Facebook who knows even less than me. There was a Facebook reel that came up <coughs> of a guy, and it was one of these don't do this yeah. things. A guy is like splicing a wire. And I he's think trying I sent to, this to you. It Was it you that sent it to me yeah. where he bites it? He bites the wire. <laughs> <laughs> he's working on some kind of fuse box on the outside of a house, yeah. and he can't get the uh, the covering off the wire, so he decides he's going to bite into and it. And shocks himself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's nearly yeah. killed. And did you say, on, did you say in your note, should have called that? Yes. <laughs> there you That's, go. That was me. Yeah. AccuTech Electric is another family run business that supports the podcast. And uh, we talk about this often. Um, you know, I can't think of anything more important in the house than your wiring. Um, it's super important that it's done properly and it's done safely. And back in 1995, Tom's dad started this company called AccuTech Electric. And by word of mouth and with good work and, uh, uh, and, and efficiency and all of the other things that you're hoping for um, when you need electrical work done, uh, that's how they built this company called AccuTech, A-C-U-T-E-C-H. When you need electrical work done, it's hard to figure out who to trust. And I know it's frightening because electrical work is never cheap. Um, but the folks at AccuTech will treat you fairly and they're as honest as the day is long, and they can do big jobs and small jobs. If you've just bought a business and you need to renovate the business and redo the wiring, they can do that. If you've got something at home that uh, smells funny and you don't uh, like what's going on, or if the uh, if the toaster uh, doesn't work when the stove is on, <laughs> those are the kinds of things where you might want to have it looked at. You ever lived in one of those houses? You know, where somebody says, don't plug in the blender because I got to unplug the lamp. <laughs> That's not a good thing. No. <laughs> it's been a while since I lived in a place like that. Yeah. But, you know, somebody says. You want to get that looked yeah, at. Yeah, you want to yeah. have that looked at by professionals. AccuTech. And by the way, generator season, they can help you with that too. Um, we'll tell you about that on another podcast. AccuTech Electric. It's A-C-U-T-E-C-H, AccuTech Dot .ca is uh, where you can find out all about them and how to contact them. We What else? Did we get through that? I we think did, yeah. I'm, I'm still making notes by the way. I think I, that's I don't good. think it's helping. No, 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 I think it's it, it, it is helping. It is helping. I make notes but I make them on my phone and yeah. then I can't find them. I got uh, some entertainment things I wanted to oh, mention okay, this week. Oh, okay, let's go. I get nice feedback from people who said, "Oh, thanks for recommending that. We've been watching it." By the way, you've been answering the email, eh? As best I can, yeah. Because yeah. I, yeah. I I go into the email and I think, oh, nobody sent us a note, but it's because you've already answered them and clicked on them. Yeah, yeah. What I can't do is I can't seem to comment on the comments that we get on, on YouTube. YouTube. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I can't get on there. So you do that, and I'll do the email. How's okay. That sound? So if you want to email us, we're anxious to read your commentary. Standing by the podcast at gmail dot com. Did I get that right? Yes. Standing by the podcast at gmail.com. And yes, we look at it every day and we get all excited when a letter pours in. Yep. <laughs> Another letter has poured in. Yeah. And a couple of people have mentioned they like when I mention stuff that we've been watching at home. So I thought we would. Uh, Jess and I just finished uh, Murders in the Building last night, season four. This is the show with Steve Martin and Martin Short and a bevy of stars uh, that were on this uh uh, this season of Murders in the Building. It's on Apple TV. Not our favorite season, to be honest with you, but we uh, we finished it up last night, and uh, we can recommend it. Jess and I would recommend that if you haven't started it. Um, I wanted to mention um, that uh, uh, there's a documentary now on that's, if you love movies, do not miss this documentary. It's a documentary on John Williams. John Williams wrote the music for everything, <gasps> everything, pretty much starting Star with Star Wars. Yeah. Star Wars. And what I learned about him is he wrote all kinds of stuff in the sixties for television shows that you had no idea. He did music pieces for Gilligan's Island. No kidding. Yeah. It's really, really, it's a fascinating, fascinating film done by Ron Howard and Brian Grazer. The man who wrote the music for Star Wars Raiders of the Lost Ark um, uh, dinosaur movie. 
<laughs> Jurassic Park. Thank you very much. <laughs> what do you want to call it? Dinosaur movie? <laughs> <laughs> no, let's call it Jurassic Park. Okay, Steven. <laughs> let's run with Steven Spielberg's idea. <laughs> and and he wrote uh, the um, the music for Schindler's List. And he tells the story of uh, how Steven Spielberg approached him for, uh, he wanted him to do the music for Schindler's List. And John Williams said to Steven Spielberg, you need a much more accomplished composer who can do much better work than I can. Jesus. And Spielberg said, I know, but they're all dead. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to do. It. Anyway, if I, I know it's on Disney Plus, not everybody has Disney Plus, but if you have it, don't mi- especially if you're a, mu- a, a movie fan, see the John Williams documentary. And I wanted to say uh I don't think he needs luck. I was going to say bonne chance. Marc Andre, Marc Andre Grande. Do you remember Denny Grande? Sure, yeah, yeah. I know Marc Andre. The I late him, Denny yeah. Grande was a show staple for many, many years. His son Marc Andre Grande is uh, a Quebec movie star. Yeah. He is a big, famous, uh, accomplished actor. You know the show Hot Ones, where they eat the wings. Have you no, seen? No, you, I've, I've heard of it. Yeah, you've yeah. seen this on video. Yeah, it's one of the most watched. Um, YouTube shows. Someone's making millions of dollars out of eating hot wings. Yeah. Yeah. And having big, big famous people come on and eat hot wings. And anyway, this, the show hot ones, uh, Marc Andre uh, Grandre has come up with the Quebec version. Oh, and I think this is such a great idea. He's doing it en français. Les eyes show. Uh, I don't know if it's called les eyes show, (laughs) but it's, uh, it's uh, the same premise. I guess he made an arrangement with the people who do it in English, and he does it in French, and he just had Valerie Plant on, which I thought was really interesting. And if you don't know the show I'm talking about, it's um, they eat ridiculously hot sauces on chicken wings while being interviewed. And it's a lot of fun. It's really, really interesting. All the shows are about, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes long. And Mark Andre thought this would be a good idea, and I think it's a great idea, and I want to wish him well with it. If you're looking for entertainment, speaking of ridiculous things on social media, there's yes. a reel that keeps popping up uh, on my Instagram reels. Matthew, is that one that I showed you? I think we might need our headphones for this. Okay, I, I gotta get. I, I can't figure this out, and I thought maybe you could make our heads or or tails of it. It's um, two German guys named Gunther and Gunther. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're they're fashion guys, mm-hmm. and they're they're trying to get involved in um, some sort of fashion thing that's I, uh, that's happening in Toronto. I don't know if you're wa- if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see their picture. They look like a couple of arseholes. They really do. Like they they've got some. Uh, <laughs> They look like, like they're full of themselves, yeah, don't you? Seriously, hey, yeah. Like, get over yourself. Yeah, yeah. one yeah. of them's in a turtleneck. The yeah. other one's got a beret on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and they're called Gunther and Gunther. They're from Berlin. They okay. are the faces of Gunt TV. What? Yeah. So Who uh, came up with that idea? I don't know, but that's a terrible idea. That's Gunt with a G. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Arriving at Archives Fashion Week 2024, happening at the Billy Bishop Airport in Toronto. <laughs> What can you play the? Okay. Um, can you play it, Matthew? The, right. um, Let's have a look at these guys. The, the video. This is them on stage. Yeah. Okay. Look at them. Yeah. Oh come on! Seriously, with yourself. could you, honest? Could you be any more pretentious? Oh my god! And now they're kissing each other. Okay. And they're. I mean, that's part of that world. But you know, they're. Yeah. This poor guy with the. Uh, look at. Oh, he, he went in for a handshake. Yeah, well, yeah. And the other guy <laughs> gave him a lingering kiss on the lips. <laughs> yeah. So, I have no idea. Okay. Uh, they, they look like Carl Lagerfeld's bastard children, <laughs> or something. <laughs> Yeah, well, apparently they're big in Germany. <laughs> yeah, well, they look like a couple of silly guns. <laughs> yeah, they do, don't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah Germany can have them. Yeah, wish anyway, them well. That's uh, yeah. yeah, that's that's Gunther and Gunther. You're gonna get a beret soon? No. Okay. <laughs> 
I don't want a beret. <laughs> I've also got the tweet sheet still to go. Terry, yes, you want to do that? Now? Absolutely, for sure. All right, I brought the teach, uh, tweet sheet to K103 in Ganawagi this How'd it week go as well. Over? Yeah. Huge, they oh, love it. Oh, really? Yeah, okay, Paul good. and uh, Chris, who I've been doing the morning show with, really like it. Okay. Uh, for this week's uh, tweet sheet on standing by Terry and Ted podcast, let's start with let's start with this uh, one here. Okay, from, uh, Sam Lee Matters at Sam Lee Matters. Tried to make a friendly comment about how I liked my neighbor's very autumnal outfit, but I swerved too hard into friendliness, soared <laughs> past over familiarity, and landed on the arguably hostile, well, if it isn't Mr. Fall. <laughs> that Is made it? me picture in my head you with your uh, yeah. with your blue and white yeah. lumber jacket. Yeah, yeah, the L.L. Bean deal. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, if it isn't Mr. Fall. <laughs> Next up, from at Corn on the Goblin, sommelier <laughs> interrupts me. Stop saying notes of ass. <laughs> I thought you'd like that as a wine connoisseur. And lastly, from Sentient Sadist, I need to get my priorities straight, but I also need to build a sandcastle. <laughs> I know people like that. <laughs> Where are you going? <laughs> got to build a sandcastle. I got to. I got to. I got to go. <laughs> Oi. What's your thoughts on? Um, what are your thoughts on the uh, Canadians? I know the Montreal every, Canadians. Yeah, everybody's. Uh, everybody. I love it's. Oh, the rebuild and the thing, and now everybody's like, fire the coach. Get well, the you know what? I was really excited about them at the beginning of the season. There's a lot of talent, but it's young yeah. talent. It needs to develop. I get yeah. that. I think there's a goaltending problem. I don't think either one of those goaltenders is particularly good. And increasingly, and I hear this from people who know more about hockey than I do, I think there is a coaching problem. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. This surprises me. Yeah. Wow. Because people love Martin St. Louis. Well, people love Martin St. Louis, the guy. Yes. Because he's a, he's a French Quebecer. Yes. He's from Laval, and he's a good guy, and he's the underdog. He's the little guy yeah. who made it big, but that doesn't make him a good coach yeah. necessarily. Wow. Okay. And I watch them on the power play, and I say, would somebody shoot the fucking puck? Yeah. Shoot on SD. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, some people are saying, well, as you know, there are 6 million people in Quebec, so there are 6 million general managers yeah, and coaches. exactly. And everybody has a different idea. But I thought everybody was going to be patient with the rebuild. And je pense pas. No. Well, how no. long have they been rebuilding now, though? Yeah. You know, when was the last time they, uh, they made the playoffs or yeah. had any kind of a hope at all? And it, you you didn't watch the World Series? Not very much of okay. it, no. Did you no. see, I got it, I got it, I don't got it? Aaron Judge? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I saw the replay. And it, yeah. I went to bed, actually, yeah. the night the Dodgers clinched. It was 4 nothing Yankees, and I thought, okay, they're going to game six. And I went to bed, and I woke up the next morning. First thing I saw was on my phone was the Dodgers celebrating the World Series victory. New Yorkers are the best because the morning after, there was a, a tweet, a meme, something going around saying that uh, Aaron Judge has been invited to Times Square for the ball drop. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to drop the ball yeah, on New yeah. Year's Eve. Yeah. I thought, thought that was terrific. And speaking of New York, now that we're looking at sports, um, I know you're, uh, um, you're sanguine about it, uh, but it, it must be hard to watch the Giants. It's, it is. Eh? It's, it's so draining. It must be. And, and I tell myself every week before I watch them lose, I say, you know what? You've seen them win four yeah. Super Bowls. Yeah. You know, anything else is a bonus. You already know they're not going to make the playoffs this year. Just watch the game and relax. Fuck! <laughs> How do you give up a first down on third and 17 I, every fucking time? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to watch. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Infuriating. Yeah. Just infuriating. And um, I urge you to read, I'll just mention this quickly because I don't know anything about it because I don't live in the city anymore. I live in the uh, Laurentians. And um, I, there was a great letter um, in the Gazette uh, this week that I think is up now if you're listening to this the week of November 5th. Um, about uh, planters. Um, there's apparently a um, kind of a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A blitz of uh, planters being put in on streets. So parking spots are being removed so that you can have uh, planters. Well, of course, that's yeah. important to have planters. Parking, schmarking. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I just think to myself, wait, wait, what? 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 I, I, you know, it's pretty and everything. Way but, the, it's you the know. way of the world. Yeah, 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 yeah. I get it. Yeah, Copenhagen. Yeah, yeah there gotcha, you go. Gotcha. We're, we're Copenhagen. Um, we uh, should, uh, I want to go see, um, and we were going to go see them because we were supposed to go to an event this week that has been canceled. Postponed. Yeah, postponed yeah. till the new year. Um, but we were going to pop in on uh, uh, our friends at uh, Rishi well, Jewelers. Well, Pierre and Linda would have been at that event. event. It's, yeah, okay. it's, a, it's a fundraiser for the uh, Fondation Ballet West de Montréal. Yes. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, it's been pushed back to early 2025 um, um, for personal reasons yes. uh, affecting uh, one, the organizers. one of the main organizers. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, we, we would have seen them there because they were there last year. Uh, so we'll just have to go by the store. Yeah. Robert Richet Jewelers. Did I, you see them cosplaying as cowboys for um, I did Halloween? Not. Yeah. I did not. Here in Linda, all dressed up as uh, okay. cowboy and cowgirl. All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they, uh, we always tell you that uh, you can look online and see – um, their their social media is great, but you really, really should go see them. I want to go see them. I mentioned last week I had backup watches, and somebody asked me what backup watch meant. I have one watch that's very important to me that I've had for a very long time that isn't a department store watch, mm -hmm. and I've got two other watches that I wear when I don't want to wear the, uh, the important watch. Right. You know, like when I was in New York, I did not want to wear the important watch. So I've got a couple of other watches that I've picked up over the years. I'm not a watch collector, but I've got a couple of watches. But they're battery driven, and no one will replace the battery Pierre anymore. Will. So I'm going to go in and see Pierre with my, my backup watches. Yeah. That's why I call them the backup watches. But you can get spectacular diamonds. You can get small, simple, elegant gifts and most importantly, you'll be welcomed with open arms. We've said this before. I used to think jewelry stores would have thrown me out or not let me in when I was in my 30s. <laughs> what are you doing here? Yeah, because I just thought, you know, you can't, if you don't have money, you can't go in there. That's not the case. If you want to talk about jewelry, you want to talk about diamond quality, you want to talk about, you know, what, what it would cost to get you a ring if you're considering popping the question, um, and you, you've got a budget that you have to work with. You know, I know there's lots of big stores and malls and stuff, but this is a small family-run business, and as soon as the door opens, uh, they're there to attend uh, to you and ask or answer any of questions, any of the questions you may have about jewelry. You will get attention to yeah. detail, and you will get it in a very friendly fashion at Robert yeah. Richet Jewelers. They're at 309 Dorval Avenue in Dorval. They're online at robertrichet.ca, and uh, they're on uh, Facebook and Instagram. Uh, Linda makes uh, some terrific uh, videos on Instagram she where she talks yeah. about different gemstones and their histories and what you can use them for and what yeah. you can match them with. And and Linda, Linda texted me this week, and uh, I was teasing her last week about saying how like how beautifully made up Linda always is. Yeah. Like she's one of those French Canadian women that yeah. if she's going to go to the store for milk, she spends three hours getting ready. Yeah. And she texted me and said, absolutely. <laughs> That's right. She said, I'm not going anywhere unless I look my very best. I was going to ask you if they were happy with the way we uh, show our support for them. I think so. I, yeah. I hope they yeah, they're are. They're good folks. Yeah. Before we go, I, uh, we should mention the passing of Quincy Jones. Quincy Jones passed away uh, just this week. I don't know when you're listening to the podcast, but uh, the the body of work that that man left behind is absolutely stunning. Everything from my favorite, absolute favorite Frank Sinatra era comes from Nelson Riddle arrangements, Quincy Jones uh, direction, um, and you know everybody knows about Thriller and his work with Michael Jackson. But if you if you Google Quincy Jones and look at his body of work, it's astonishing how many people he worked with. 28 Grammy Awards on 80 Grammy nominations. Yeah, yeah. really, really uh, uh, quite something. Uh, Quincy Jones uh, passed away at the age of, uh, I think he was 91. And the country this past week lost a legendary Canadian artist named John Little. If you're a Montrealer, you probably know who John Little is. When I see any of John Little's paintings, I immediately, I'm at home. He was an, an extraordinary artist. 
um, that left an unbelievable body of work that you can still buy. Um, you have you have to have money, um, but his paintings are are still available. And uh, he was a remarkable talent that left a mark on the art world, um, and left a mark personally with Terry Mosher. He was Terry Mosher's godfather. Oh, nice! And and Terry put a terrific piece in the Gazette this week. Uh, paying tribute to the late, great John Little. If you don't know who he is, do yourself a favor and Google him. His Montreal scenes are legendary in the art world. Well, we made it all the way through without me singing a song. Uh, <laughs> did you get some nice feedback from... Uh, no, sir, not a bit. Not a bit, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Ted did some singing on the episode last week, so yeah. we, we, were, uh, we were singing free this week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next week, though, maybe okay. maybe Danny Boy, <laughs> <laughs> or should I save that for March for around St. Patrick's Day? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah well, we're around St. Patrick's Day. We're going to have to do our deedly deedly. I'll have to do the deedly deedly, yeah. and maybe and maybe I'll start writing Christmas uh, Christmas carols. And yes, I'll do, I'll do some Christmas carol polkas. Yes, Rudolph, Rudolph, <laughs> Rudolph is a reindeer, and. Uh, backwards Christmas carols were a big hit. Oh, that's true too. Ixnel flop, Ixnel flop. We were so stupid and they paid us. Elk Nidge Slab, Elk Nidge Slab, Elk Nidge Law at Yah. <laughs> uh, tis, like a Matthew. Yeah, I know. He's going, what the fuck what is wrong with him? <laughs> tis the season, though, eh, Ted? Yeah, sure is. <laughs> our thanks to Matthew, who is uh, our producer of uh, these episodes. Our thanks to uh, Pantelis and uh, Mike Ward. And a big thank you to Sugar Sammy. Don't forget to go to sugarsammy.com. Our good friends at the Mersons. Accutech Electric. That's accutech.ca. Um, also, uh, Robert Riche Jewelers, we were just talking about them, and our title sponsor, as always, the UPSStoreCanada.ca. We'll see you next week. Standing by, the Terry and Ted podcast has been brought to you by the UPS Store Canada, delivering full-service solutions for your small business. 